Hi, I'd like to welcome everybody today. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited about nature-based learning and early childhood. Um, let me think. I want to make sure that we all understand that um, today, that today we're having um, a visitor from Urban Ecology Center presenting about early childhood education and bringing it out into the outdoors. And we're hosted by the United General District 304, where I work as a program coordinator for the Thriving Children and Families Pillar. And it's been funded, this program has been funded by the Department of Health Local Strategies for Physical Activity and Nutrition Grant. And that's also who's been helping us with um, the gardening projects and Harvest of the Month and Harvest for Healthy Kids. So they're very committed to ways that we can bring children to the outdoors. Um, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to introduce Matt to us and we're going to let him get started. I will at the end of the session, I will be sending out an email that will have links to both the English version of its presentation and a Spanish slideshow. So you'll have that. Um, somewhere in the middle, I'm going to do a drawing for the gift that really fun. We do have the finger puppets. That's one of my favorite. And I always love a good felt board, as well as a book that will help you to be able to implement this in your programs. So that's going to be fun. If you have questions, put them in chat. But we have so much material to cover. If we do not get to them during today's session, we will, Matt and I will both respond in an email afterwards. And we will try to address anything that comes up. And take it away, Matt. All right. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Give me a thumbs up, mid, left. All right. Good, good, good. Um, we're going to go through the presentation. I created a sway. It's kind of like a much, much better version of PowerPoint. And that will provide you with a leave behind, like Susan was saying. Plus, I also created, uh, over the pandemic, I created some virtual PEEP. Um, resources that will kind of just get your creative juices flowing as far as what we can do connecting very young children with the outdoors. Um, so I'm really thrilled to be here, uh, but let's let's get this party started. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. If everything is right with the world, we should be good. There we go. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm going to put this over on the other side. All right. So today's session is about designing nature-based early childhood experiences. And I'm going to just do a little overview of what we're going to be doing today. Our session overview goes over the Urban Ecology Center's education models. I started my career in NEEP, and I designed PEEP. And what you're experiencing today is through our eco peep or our uh, teacher trainings. Um, my commitment with early childhood, nature-based early childhood has been to bring it to, um, you know, make it inclusive, to bring it to audiences that are normally overlooked in environmental education. So, um, and then we're gonna go over the three different types of nature-based early childhood experiences, vicarious, in direct and direct. And then I have some tips for preparation as well as um, risk analysis, the difference between a risk and a hazard uh, when exploring the outdoors, and then some of the benefits and some pro tips for outdoor ex exploration. So the organization that I'm with is called the Urban Ecology Center. And our mission is that we connect people in cities to nature and each other. Very simple, but very powerful. I'm very proud to be part of the Urban Ecology Center. Um, it's actually my second career. I used to wear a suit and tie and do sales and marketing. That's a whole nother story, but um, I'm so thrilled to be able to introduce nature to very young children. Uh, and then our vision is to inspire generations to build environmental curiosity 
understanding, and respect. We restore hope and heal our urban natural world neighborhood by name. We have three Milwaukee locations. I'm coming to you live from um, the Riverside Park location. That was our original flagship. We also have Washington Park and Menominee Valley serving uh, three very different neighborhoods in Milwaukee. Um, when I first started at the Urban Ecology Center 15 years ago, I was part of the NEEP project which is the Neighborhood Environmental Education Project. What we do is we partner with schools within a two mile radius of the Urban Ecology Center. We do eight field trips a week. We go to the school, we pick, a, pick up a classroom, we bring them back to our outdoor classrooms or our adjacent green spaces. We do programs, outdoor exploration inquiry based, and we take them back. And then in the afternoon, we pick up another group. So it could be, K-4, uh, it's K-4 through high school. It might be first grade in the morning and eighth grade in the afternoon. Um, and through that program, I did that for about eight years. And I would see about 12,000, 11,000 kids a year. So it's a lot of, um, a lot of exposure to children to a green space that's in their neighborhood. Because remember, they're within a two mile radius. So not only do we have this during the school year, but we also have summer camps. And there's lots of different types of um, experiences that kids can have throughout the summer. One of them that I designed, which I'm very proud of, we're, we're in our fifth year, is forest camp. I'm currently doing that right now. It's 10 weeks, all day, all outdoor, K-4, K-5 summer camp right here in the city. That is a PhD in nature education. It is really what it's all about. All of the programs that happen throughout the school year, then children can get immersed during the summer. Um, something that you might not know about Sway, if you're not familiar with it, when you have the presentation, each of these little bars, it has like little pop-ups that kind of tell you a little bit more information. That's very helpful. Also, down on the lower right hand side, there's a table of contents. So if you pull that up, you can go to any part of the presentation. Um, very helpful so you're not scrolling forever in a year. Um, you can also pop out photos as they come along. And all of the photos that you'll see in this presentation were taken by me. That's one of my hobbies is nat um, taking nature, you know, nature photography and phonology or um, kind of paying attention to the happenings that happen throughout the year. Um, so you'll see a lot of great photos of not only nature, but kids enjoying nature. So we have the NEEP program and then summer camps. But what I started to see in the NEEP program, we started in K-4, but I was still seeing kids that were coming to me saying, they were thinking there were bears in the woods and alligators in the Milwaukee River. There was just kind of a disconnect. And I thought, what we really need to do is we need to go younger. So I had a partner that um, had a K-3 classroom. So I asked her if I could come and do a, a program with, their, with her K-3s. And it went so famously that I went to a different partner that had a, a learning center that, you know, six weeks through, six, uh, through school age. And I said, can I do a toddler program? How about pro programs with twos? And they're like, sure. And that went so good, I even went as young as one. So that was the beginning of the PEEP program. And that's been, we're in our eighth year now. PEEP stands for Preschool Environmental Education Project. And what I do is I partner with early learning centers, child care centers, mm -hmm. preschools, kindergartens, intergen shared inter intergenerational centers, uh, special needs classrooms, um, and I do both in school, near space. So near space programs are on their school property or within a like a walkable green space. And then starting at age three, we do field trips to our outdoor classrooms. So that has been very successful. I don't quite see as many kids because the ratios are smaller, 
So I see about six to 7,000 kids a year, still a lot. Um, and I do about 245 programs. Um, I have a co-teacher, her name is Alex Labonte. I just um, was able to secure her this year. So that's very exciting. I was getting very tired doing everything myself. So hooray for that. Um, and so with PEEP, um, really, it's the beginning of those early relationships. Now, I may not see as many kids, but I do see a lot of adults. And I do teacher trainings with my partners, as well as family presentations and presentations like you're doing today, like we're doing today. That's part of the Eco Peep program. Um, and I also, um, Starting August 1st, if anybody's very inspired about today's presentation, I do a, um, an online course, uh, Urban Nature-Based Early Childhood Education, starting August 1st. It's a uh, 12 hours, four three-hour online synchronous classes. Um, you can do that for college credit, or you can do that for a badge, or you can do that for registry credit. Um, so when you receive this presentation, there's a link um, right in here that'll take you to the page if that's something that would, um, that would excite you. It's a really good course. I really, there uh, was a few bright spots with the pandemic. One is that I took my 15 years of experience and boiled it down into digital format, um, which allowed me to do presentations like this. And it allowed me to bring nature-based early childhood education to a much wider audience. So that's a, a real bonus. Um, so I think another thing that I really appreciate about the Urban Ecology Center is that uh, the social justice aspect. Um, it was very important to me to bring nature-based child experiences to a younger audience. I think the sweet spot for environmental education is like third and fourth grade. It's like everybody visits the nature center at third and fourth grade, but really it's kind of a lifelong skill. And after doing you know, early childhood, nature-based early childhood for so long, I realized that that's really, we, we are so blessed to be able to really introduce children to their world. And there's nothing more special than the outside than the nature, than the natural world. It's, as practical as you can get. And not only is it special and healthy and there's lots of benefits, but it also meets your um, early childhood development and growth needs. So it's really a win-win for educators, for children, for families. It's really where it's at. So <clears throat> bringing environmental education to children one to three years old, to preschool and kindergarten classrooms, English, English language learners, um, the call and repeat format of all the programming is really great for dual language learners, um, children with disabilities. Um, also, I partner with two of the largest inter shared inter intergenerational facilities here in Milwaukee. I don't know, that sounds awesome, like, oh, cool, you know, really young children and grand friends. But when you actually experience a program like that, it is truly beautiful. It's just the bookends of our, um, of our existence. It's really special. Um, and then not only that, but we're bringing nature-based early childhood okay, education to urban landscapes. So these, Milwaukee is densely populated and a lot of um, people are a little unsure what to do with um, nature education when there's not this lush 150 acres of gorgeousness. So um, it's really showing teachers that they can do nature education even on a square plot with a few trees and some cement. So here at the Urban Ecology I Center, there's all sorts of experiences for that kids live enjoy. Live translation. And then we're seeing lots of really special kids. You can definitely take a look back at this presentation and look at the. Um, at the photos a little bit closer. 
I have some suggested resources that can help you bring things out. I actually did, um, I have a, a, a nature-based early childhood certificate through David Sobel and at Antioch University. And through that program, he included two of my case studies in his The Sky Above and the Mud Below. Very practical book on bringing nature-based education to um, inclusive audiences. Uh, Nature-based learning for young children. That would be that'll be in the giveaway today. Good choice, Susan. Um, Balanced and Barefoot is one that I just read. I think it's a good introduction if you're not really familiar with nature-based early childhood education. It kind of goes through a lot of the um, things that um, are pretty essential to the the movement. Um, also, Claire Warden uh, over in Scotland. Some really incredible stuff that she provides. Um, and then uh, Rachel Laramore. There's definitely some some good resources out there if you would like to dig a little bit deep. Um, so what we're going to go over today are three types of nature-based early childhood experiences. These include vicarious, indirect, and direct experiences. We're going to start with vicarious and indirect. And then we'll move into the direct experiences, which are like moving to the outdoors. So the roadmap for nature-based early childhood, starting at age one, is that in my, in what I do, the first thing that I do is to establish relationships. I introduce them to Mr. Flower and Miss Alex. And um, during those first years, we're just establishing trust and kind of just really just establishing those relationships. As they spiral through the programs, so I'm seeing the same kids year after year. Um, then we begin to develop general knowledge and skills for success. So instead of it just being a bird, we're actually introducing vocabulary. It's not just a bird, it's a cardinal. And it's not just a turtle, it's a painted turtle. Kids are very able to pick out different symbols, different brands. It is perfectly um, developmentally appropriate to start to introduce them to actual names of animals, flora and fauna. And then at age three, we start to apply these skills. Um, we're talking about, you know, in age two, group management, working together as a group, following directions, same as you do in your classrooms. And then at age three, we're applying these skills and we're guiding explorations. So that's the first time that we go on field trips. It's usually in the spring to the Urban Ecology Center. But during the year, we do some near space programs and also some indoor things. And then as they get a little bit older, so age four, really what we're doing Age four, five, six, it's all outdoors. It's direct experiences in nature. Really you just wanna do that immersive education. And then up until age six, we're just encouraging extended time in nature with ample unstructured play. That's kind of the roadmap that I use with my PEAT program. Um, nature, at the heart of what you're doing will really provide you with all of those tools and all of those skills that children need to um, move through their developmental success. Um, really what you're doing is you're, you know, they're, they're seeing things out in nature and then they're going from just identifying and classifying things to making predictions. So really by including vicarious, indirect and direct experiences, you're building up their knowledge so that they're confident and they're successful. And when they're exploring the outdoors, they're really doing that in a way that's responsible. And we're building land stewards, right? We're, we're, we're building children and adults that love the outdoors and will care for the outdoors. Um, Let's start with our vicarious nature-based early childhood experiences. Now, vicarious experiences um, or symbolic experiences are when 
children are playing with the idea of nature. So this includes dramatic play, storytelling, season stories, audio dramas, and puppet shows. Um, Pete program is filled with vicarious experiences at one and two years old into three years old. Um, I think really this image that we're seeing, these are the puppets and the props and the things that I use for children between one and four years old. I'm using the same materials, but just in different ways. And I use them indoors and outdoors. I think puppets are really, really important. Um, they're a great way to mimic animal behaviors and to facilitate dramatic play. And they're a great engaging tool for teaching children the names, appearances, habitats, diets, adaptations, and behaviors of animals that actually live in their area. So I love the zoo and I love uh, the farms, um, but really what we're, I'm trying to do is I'm trying to introduce them to the wildlife, both the flora and the fauna that they can find right outside their door at the park that's down the street from their house, right? Um, I don't think they need any help with the barnyard animals. They know what pigs and, and sheep and maybe not so much anymore. But, uh, and then the zoo, we have, you know, animals from all over the world. They know lots about the rainforest and rhinos and giraffes. But really what we're trying to do is we're trying to introduce them to the nature in their backyard. So through Folk Manus and Acorn Naturalist and other resources on the internet, you can find all sorts of birds. These are some of the puppets that I use. There are mammals, reptiles and amphibians, insects and other arthropods. These are all great ways to introduce children to the flora and the fauna in their neighborhood. And matter of fact, I think now is a perfect time. So when I first started PEEP, I would get um, requests from early childhood classrooms to do presentations. And I got a, present, uh, a request from um, an early childhood classroom that said, they're doing a high interest day at our school and it's for the older kids. Can you come in and do something for the young children? I'm like, sure, no problem. She goes, okay, it'll be a classroom and you'll come in and you can do whatever you want. And then she called me back and she said, well, we're gonna combine some classes. It's gonna be a little bit larger of a group. I said, okay, no problem. And then she contacted me one more time and she goes, actually, we're just gonna have the early childhood classes go to the gym. And if you could just do a presentation for about 120 kids for an hour, that would be great. <laughs> and I don't, I mean, I don't care who you are, maybe Rafi, we could be like, woohoo, but that is uh, very intimidating. So what I would normally do just wasn't quite fitting the bill. So I actually had to create something new. I couldn't bring in an animal. I can't facilitate with that many kids. I couldn't do a puppet show because that's just not engaging enough for that many kids. So what I decided to do is what I do a lot of now, it's called season stories. And it's kind of a, an interactive, um, kind of a puppet show, but I'm not behind a puppet stage. And I'm gonna do kind of an abridged version of you uh, of this for you today. Um, and it's just a way to kind of, it's a movement-based story and it's usually starts and ends. So it has like a full day or a season. Um, they can be as short as 10 minutes or I do them as long as an hour. And you may think, you know, usually a three-year-old you know, early childhood, they can usually, their attention span equals their age. So usually anything above 10, 15 minutes is just not engaging enough. But I'm here to tell you that this format, I engage children for up to an hour. And they're really fun. And um, I think you're really going to enjoy it. In this presentation, I've included my fall and winter sound story. And I also have in my virtual PEEP presentation that will be shared with you, um, all of the different types of vicarious experiences are videotaped. So 
I am going to ask to be put on presenter view. Um, and maybe I should stop sharing my, let's see. It's not showing me, but is it is it in presenter view right now? Because it looks like I, I think I might have to stop the sharing. Stop share. All right. Speaker view. I see you, Susan. <laughs> All right. Can everybody? Is it working now? Don't worry. All right. Give me a thumbs up if we can see me on the screen here. All right, fantastic. Now, from our discussion before to now, I am now going to become Mr. Flower. So, good morning, everybody. My name is Mr. Flower. Everybody say hi, Mr. Flower. Oh, wonderful, hooray. Now, I have a quick question. Do you love stories? If you love stories, put your finger on your nose. Not on your nose, on your nose. Good job, good job, good job. Now, today is not like any story there's no book. Everybody say, what? And, and there's no pages. Everybody say, what about a hey? I know, I know. But we're going to be the book. We're going to be the pages. And the animals are going to help us tell the story. Now, this story starts very early in the morning. Before you're awake, before your family's awake, even before the sun is awake. So what I want what you to do is I want you to fall asleep. Now, as the sun rises, I want you to whisper, sunshine. Everybody whisper, sunshine. And as the sun rises, we get louder and louder. Everybody say, sunshine. 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 Yay! Let's make our way to the prairie. Now, the prairie is where the tall grasses and the flowers are. Now, oh, who do we have here? We have our friend the caterpillar. Oh, yeah. You know the hungry, hungry caterpillar. It likes to eat, eat and eat and eat until it's nice and plump. But does a caterpillar stay a caterpillar forever? No. Eventually, that caterpillar makes itself into a chrysalis. Yep. Here we are in the chrysalis. Everybody give yourselves a nice chrysalis hug. And then everybody say two weeks, two weeks. Now, our friend the caterpillar stays in its chrysalis for two weeks. And then eventually it emerges as a beautiful, beautiful butterfly. Oh, super wonderful. Hey, did you know that you can make a butterfly? Take your hands like this. Let me see your hands. And then put your drumsticks together. And then everybody go flutter, 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 flutter. Good job. Now hold on to that butterfly. This is what I want you to do. On the count of three, I want you to throw your butterfly up in the air. I'm going to catch it with my neck, okay? Oh, I don't like it. Okay. Are you ready? In Espanol. Uno, dos, tres. Throw it up in the air. Good job. Watch again. Watch again. Watch again. Oh, we caught some. Oh, my goodness gracious. Oh, my. Look at these beautiful butterflies we caught. Oh, here's our tiger swallowtail. Here they go. Good job. Good job. Oh, and we've got the red admiral. We've got I I, sir. And then we've got our beautiful monarch. Oh, such an intrepid traveler. And then we've got our friend, the question mark. Everybody say, what? That's its actual name. And we have our morning cloak. Oh, that's so nice. Now, our friend the butterfly visits the flowers. The flowers are in the prairie. 
Let's see who else visits the flowers. Oh, it's our friend the bumblebee. Now, what does a bumblebee say? Perfect. I actually speak bumblebee. Now, the bumblebee visits the flower. First comes the flower, then pollination, and then the seeds. So after it gets pollinated, our wonderful flower drops its seeds onto the prairie floor. And then who do we have here? Our friend, the goldfinch. Now, every bird has a special color and a special sound. Goldfinches love to eat sunflower seeds. Now, what color do we have here? Yellow, good. Now I know that you know that I know you know your colors. Good job. Now, our friend, the goldfinch, when it flies, it goes potato chip, potato chip. You try that. Potato chip, potato chip. Good, 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 good. Oh, and then we've got our friend, the cardinal. What color do we have here? Oh, good. Very good. Now, our friend, the cardinal, when it sings, it goes pretty, pretty. Yes, yes, yes. You try that. Pretty, pretty. Yes, yes, yes. And then sometimes in the spring, I call it the Star Wars bird because it goes choo, 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 choo. You try that. Choo, 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 choo. And then we've got our friend, the blue jay. Oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because it has blue feathers. Now, blue jays like to say their own name. They go, J, J, J. You try that. J, J, J. Good. Oh. And then we've got our friend, the robin. Oh, now, the robin, when it sings, it goes, cheerio, cheerio. You try that. Cheerio, cheerio. Oh, and look, it, it's got its little chicks in the nest. Eeny, meeny, miny, say, edo, edo, edo. Now, when they hatch out, they love worms. Oh, 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 oh. Wait, do you eat worms? No, that's because you're not a robin. That makes a lot of sense. Did you bring any worms today? What? You did? Let me see. Let me see the word. You learned this. Oh, and then go ahead and get yum, 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 yum. Oh, thank you. That was so, you are so good to the birds. Now, as we were walking through the prairie, we scared up our friend, the cottontail rabbit. Now, it's got a cottontail right there. It's got a little cottontail, and it's got these long ears. We're listening, so let me see your rabbit ears. Make them really long, and then everybody say, "What? What was that?" It was nothing. Don't worry about it. What's it? What was that? It was coming. It was nothing. Don't worry about it. Maybe it was our friend the deer. Wow. Now we can tell that this is a boy because of its antlers. Yeah. Now this is a white-tailed deer out on the west coast. There, I think you have mule deers, and they have mule deer have a black tail. Our friends here in Wisconsin have a white tail. And you can tell it's a boy because of its antler. You know what? I brought my fantastic nature container. Now, pro tip with children, anything in a bag or a box or hidden is all of a sudden very mysterious. So in my fantastic nature container, I have all sorts of things, real animal things that you can explore. Oh, now, what's cool about deer is that when they, in the spring, their antlers start really small. Let me see your small antlers. And everybody say spring. And then as they grow, say summer, fall, winter, and then they fall off. Everybody say, what? It's true. They grow new antlers every year. And if you're lucky, you can actually find them out in the forest. Whoa, super awesome. Wow, let's see here. Do I look like a deer? Not really. How about now? Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Now, whenever I bring out something for the children, you know, for the children, what I always tell them is to use their science words. Scientists are always describing things. They're, they're comparing things. So I bring this around, I have them use their hands. Now tell me, how does it feel? Is it hard or is it soft? Is it smooth? Is it rough? Is it heavy or is it light? Scientists are always describing things and comparing it to things that they know. Very, very important. Now, as we leave our friends in the prairie, we've got our friends in the pond. 
So we're moving from habitat to habitat. Now, who do we have here? Oh, yeah. What was that? Duck? What? Oh, you said duck. I thought you told me the duck. Sorry about that. Yes. Now, what does a duck say? A duck says quack. Yeah. Now, in the cartoons, they say quack. But we're older and we're smarter. They don't just say quack. They go quack, quack. So you give them a try. Go quack, 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 quack. That is one silly duck. And then we have our friend, the red-winged blackbird. That makes sense. It has a little red on its, on its wing. Now, the red-winged blackbird loves to live down by the river or the ponds. And they go, vote for me, vote for me. You try that. Vote for me, vote for me. Oh, yeah. Birds live in different habitats. Oh, and then we have our friend, the frog. Now, what does the frog say? Yeah, I know. Everybody says ribbit, ribbit. But just like our friends, the birds, all sorts of frogs have different sounds, too. We might have the spring peeper. They go peeper. You try that. Peeper. And then we've got the bullfrog that goes badonk, badonk. Peeper, badonk. Peeper, badonk. Good. Oh, and then we've got our friend, the turtle. Now, when a turtle is scared, they hide in their shell. Oh, say, it's OK. It's OK. Oh. It's okay. It's all right, sweetie. Oh, animals are very sweet when you're sweet to them. And then we've got another friend that's even slower than the turtle. This is our friend, Sammy the snail. Everybody say hi, Sammy. Now, Sammy thinks that he's super fast. Do you think Sammy is slow or fast? Yeah. He's going to show you how fast he is. Are you ready? On the count of three, he's going to turn on his turbo motor. One, two, three. Oh, Sammy, I know. He thinks he's fast, but yeah, I suppose it's all relative, right? Maybe he's slower than a turtle, but you know, not as fast as a, uh, as a cheetah. Now let's see here. Oh, and we've got our friend, the great blue heron. Wow, look at the long legs on this friend. Now they have a very special talent. And all of these presentations are filled with not only sounds and movements, but also body movements, because that's how you can be with children for an hour and still make it engaging. So you got to get up and you got to move. They're not meant to just sit there and listen. So here we have our friend, the great blue heron. Now, they like to stand up on one leg. So you try that. You go up on one leg, and then they take their long beak, and they grab a fish. One, two, three, out. Mm, nom, 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 nom. Now try the other leg. I know it's hard. Give it a try. One, two, three, out. Mm, nom, 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 nom. Very talented. Now, the great blue heron isn't the only uh, one that likes to fish. People like to fish too. Now, here, let me put on my fishing hat. And I've got my Tinkerbell fishing pole. Oh, yeah. All right. Let's see here. Oh. I see a trout. I see a trout. Let's see if we can get it. Yes! Oh! Look at it. I caught a rainbow trout. Oh! Fantastic. Oh, I love it so much. Now, who else do we have in our pond? Oh, look at it. It's our friend, the beaver. Now, here's the deal, though. You can't say beaver. No, say beaver. No, go, go, go. Say beaver. Say hello, beaver. And then what you do is you burn out your tree, good job, and then you chew it down and go, <laughs> and then the timber. <laughs> oh, yeah, rotate. Yep. It's just like corn on the cob. Oh, yeah, beaver loves. You know what, beaver? I saw something in here. Was that you that put this in here? Oh, beaver. He's, he's not this in my fantastic nature container. This is his afternoon snack. All right, that's for you. All right. Now, as we move from the pond, we go to the forest. Now, Beaver, you can't, you can't cut down this one right here. This is a home for different animals. Oh, we've got our friend, the woodpecker. Oh, yeah. You can tell it's a boy because it's got a little red on the back of his head. Bring out your tree and go. Oh, yeah, they pack on the wood there. They're looking for tasty bugs right underneath the bark. 
Who else? Do, oh, look at it's our friend the squirrel. Everybody say hi, Samantha. Hi. Oh yeah. Squirrels love acorns. Do you have any acorns in here? Oh, let's see here. Oh, there's a sunflower. Oh, here's an acorn. I love laminating real pictures of seed and different foods. Food is a great way to engage children with um, a lot of this play acting because usually when you give kids puzzles, I don't know why, but the first thing they do is they fight, 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 fight. So a really good way to engage children is, and it's also teaching them what animals eat, is to provide them with food that they can get. Yum, 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 super tasty central. Oh, and then we've got, what are you doing in here, Chip? Oh, here's Chip the chipmunk. Now, chipmunks love acorns too. They go ahead and they put them in their cheeks. So take your acorn and go, ow. And then another one go, ow, ow. And then they, they put it in their underground bed and they store that food for all winter long. Oh, I tell you what, good times. Oh, and then who else do we have here? We have our friend, the possum. Everybody say hi, possum. Now, possum is very talented. They can hang upside down by their tail. Oh, look at its baby possum. Oh, now when the mama possum gives birth, they put their babies on their back like this, kind of like a baby bath mat. I know, I know, it's super cute. Now, when a possum is scared, it doesn't have a shell that it goes into. No, 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 no. What they do is they pretend they're not alone. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say danger, and I want you to play possum. You do that by going, whoa, whoa. is the danger gone? Okay, good. One, two, three, danger. Whoa. Is the danger gone? It is. And then if you want to go next level, you can do Hollywood possum. So when I say danger, you've got to really play it up, all right? One, two, three, danger. Go down the light. Perfect. Uh oh, friends. I've got some bad news. We've got our friend the skunk. Everybody say PU. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Just because a skunk can stink doesn't mean it goes around stinking all the time. They're very misunderstood. They only do that if they're really scared. The first thing they do if they're scared is they get a wreath that comes through the spray. And then, if, they're, if the person, if it's still not getting hit, then they stomp their paws. So, stomp your paws. Get a wreath of it. And I still didn't get the hint. Then they turn around. Everybody say, oh, no. And then if they still don't get the hit, oh, 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 I tell you the one, whoever didn't listen will make that mistake one time. I tell you that. Oh, and then we've got our friend, the bat. Oh, creature of the night. I love him so much. Now, bats, a lot of teachers try to get us kids to like bats by saying that they eat mosquitoes, but I got some bad news. They really don't eat mosquitoes. That would be like you and me eating a piece of bread, a crumb at a time. They like big juicy moths. Oh yeah, they love them so much. Did you happen to bring any moths today? You did? Go ahead and throw it up in the air. Oh yes. Oh yes. My goodness gracious, excuse me. More, 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 more. Throw them up in the air. Yeah. Oh, super tasty. Now I tell you what, the sun is starting to go down. Everybody say sunshine. And as the sun goes down, sunshine, sunshine. And then up comes the moon. Everybody say hello, moon. Hello, moon. Hello, moon. Hello, moon. Oh, and here we are in the nighttime. I tell you what, it's getting a little chilly. Maybe we should make a campfire. Now, in order to make a campfire, we have to have three different types of sticks. We need little sticks, medium sticks, and big sticks. Go ahead and give me your little sticks. Oh, yeah, those little chickadee sticks. Oh, thank you. I'm going to put them right there. And then your medium sticks are about as big as your arm. Yep, give those to me. Those arms are a little heavier. Good job. And then we've got the big mumbo jumbo logs. What? Oh, 
to our gallery. I'm going to share my screen again. Ugh, those stories are so much fun to do and children absolutely love them. The sweet spot is three years old, but four and five also love them. Two, not so much. Sometimes I do them in my early adventures groups. I do like a bridged version just to kind of introduce the day. They're very flexible, very fun. You can add, you can, you know, they can be as long or as short as you want. They're just fantastic. I love them big bunches. Now, let's go ahead and go back to our presentation. All right. So that is a great way to introduce puppets. And that is a perfect example of vicarious interactions, vicarious experiences play acting, you can really just do so much with that. There's also movement-based songs. In this presentation, I have one that it sounds like if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands, but it's different, but it's based on the seasons. I like to take familiar songs and then change the lyrics. My season song, I usually do that in the season stretch to introduce my sound story. So if you have time, you can go ahead and look back at that. And then here I have the fall sound story and also the winter sound story. So every season brings new experiences, new animals. That was kind of a amalgamation that was more based on habitats, but you can do it however you like. Um, sometimes sheets, I use sheets a lot to, I call them sheet stories um, to represent the different seasons. Uh, and then each season has different props and puppets that I use in the winter. I use lots of uh, crumpled up recycled paper and we have snowball fights and lots of good things that you can do with that. 
And then I like to combine both vicarious and indirect experiences within those. And we'll go over those just a little bit more. But I'm always using these same materials just in different ways. So each of these has different types of props and puppets and things that I use. Sometimes things are on top of the sheets. Sometimes things are underneath the sheets. So I like to combine them in different ways. This is very, this is part of a somewhere under the rainbow. It's a program that I do with toddlers. That's a lot of fun. So we go throughout these stations and then underneath are different animals to experience. So this are with the birds. And then this is like the pond. And you can kind of get that, you know. Uh, it's a really great way, because like I said, anytime you put thing, something into a, a colorful bag or underneath a sheet, that mystery adds a lot to whatever you're um, experiencing. And then, let's see. I also, over the pandemic, did some, I collaborated with one of my coworkers, Danny, to do these nature mystery audio dramas. I, I just highly recommend that you come back and listen to these. It was something that they were talking about podcasts and I was like, podcasts, I, I don't really listen to them, but I knew what they were. And then I thought, you know, I have these really like elaborate puppet shows that I used to do. I could do it like the old time radio mysteries, right? Oh, and it was just so much fun. And they turned out, so cool. So definitely take a moment. You could do one of these. It's just so neat. I've got one about Mitch, the case of Mitch the missing mosquito. And then I've got one about uh, the celebration allegation with Julia Owls. They're just, so I do multiple voices. I used to do a lot more puppet shows. Now I do all like sound stories like this, but boy, we used to like really do a lot of puppet shows. So that was really fun because I was able to record it. Highly recommend you going back and listening to them. Uh, and then, you know, you can still do puppet shows. These are best for like K4, K5. Once they get into first grade, they're like, you know, that's not real. They like to tell you that, oh, it's just not real. Because they like to tell you how it's just they know everything. And three years old, they tend like, you know, when I press the button and I go down the elevator, they like, Afterwards, they ask me if they can see the elevator because there's, I mean, it's really suspending disbelief. So K4, K5 is really the sweet spot for puppet shows. And I've included one of my Five Senses puppet show scripts. They're really just a lot of fun. Um, highly recommend. Great vicarious experiences. So we're moving out of the vicarious um, experiences into the indirect experience. Now, these are when you're exploring real nature in a controlled setting. So that's like when you bring in leaves or seeds or rocks into the classroom, nests, feathers. Here we have listed all sorts of indirect experience. Like these are the materials that we would use. I think um, this also includes something like gardening which is an incredible experience, but that's not a direct experience. Um, it's, it's real nature, but in a controlled setting. Um, botanical gardens, zoos are examples of these indirect, and, and they're, really, they're really important because what they do is they bridge these vicarious experiences into the direct experiences. So it's showing them, so that's why a lot of times I'll, include indirect materials in my vicarious experiences. So like the antlers and a turtle shell. Um, this also includes like doing experiments, you know, it's kind of, these are indirect experiences that are really important, but they're a good bridge for the indoors to the outdoors. Um, live animals are also something, we have a native Wisconsin animal room. You can have nature centers come into your classroom. A lot of these experiences are really cool um, and very valuable. And they show kids, they allow them to kind of move through their fears in a controlled setting. 
I always would bring, so I would do a sound story or a season story. And then at the end, I would have a turtle, a, like a live box turtle, which is awesome because it's different than a painted turtle. Box turtles live in the prairie. So it's a turtle that doesn't live in the water. I like showing kids the diversity. Um, and then I also would bring in a garter snake. Uh, snakes are something that people, especially adults, have a, a hard time with. Um, kids, not so much. But a lot of times I use those experiences for kids to gain confidence, right? Because every time you're afraid of something and you do it, you teach yourself that you can do anything. And it's really giving kids that confidence and that trust that it's okay. They can be these misunderstood creatures are sweet, just like they are. And we're part of nature. So it's really kind of important for kids to, to bridge those experiences. Um, but yeah, I, you know, like leaves and rocks. And this is also something that I do. I'm not a huge fan of crafts, um, especially like what I call refrigerator art, which is where you make it and then it's just displayed. Really the only crafts that I do is if it promotes um, interactive play. Um, but I also love what's called ephemeral art. And that's where you take like leaves and you kind of make a mandala or something like that, or you take rocks, we call them museums or share spots. You take these indirect, these, you know, these real nature materials, and then you put them in a place that you can either share or experience or make it into a pattern. It's really amazing. And then experiencing like real seeds, you know, like maple seeds, samaras, that the helicopter seeds, so much fun. And walnut seeds where you can smell that citrusy smell. And then I like to include snacks. Eating snacks outside is just great. So like berries and fruits and nuts and seeds. These are great ways to kind of connect um, life cycles with your cycle, right? It's really quite amazing. So hickory nuts and all sorts of beautiful uh, flower, wildflower seeds and acorns and having children experience the diversity of nature really is kind of, it's just, it's a reflection on what makes strong communities. Diversity is what makes nature strong and it's what makes us strong. So like I said, I weave in indirect experiences into my vicarious experiences. And you can see some of them here, our native Wisconsin animal room. There's the garter snake, Ooh, that was Teton, I miss Teton. Animal furs, real animals, bird nests, a lot of times I'll take, uh, for the toddlers, I'll take a tent out to their play yard and we get to play with a lot of the, um, the puppets that we experienced uh, in the programs. And again, I'm using those same materials, but just in different ways. So we're doing a lot of interactive play. We fly to the other end of the playground and we take our Audubon bird and we put it in the real nest. It's these ways that, I'm not teaching kids about nature, we're playing with nature. And you know that play is the highest form of research. So that's really important. So everything is working up to these direct nature-based early childhood experiences. That is where the magic happens. That is where David Sobel calls it courting the magic. And that is really what it's all about. Direct experiences have a wild nature to them. So you can be in your playground and you see a robin nesting up in one of the eaves. That is a, a direct experience. So it may seem like that would be like an indirect experience, but that's, a wild, that's wild nature. It has to have include that spontaneity and it's really, it can't be replaced. You can't, you can't replicate that in the classroom. You can't replicate that in a zoo, really, you have to get outside. That's the only way that you can increase the number of direct nature-based experiences for children. You have to go outside, go outside, go outside. 
I cannot stress it enough. It is really, really important. And like I said, it could be in a nearby green space, it can be on your schoolyard, or it can be right in their backyard, but it has to have that wild nature about it. And that's really what it's about. I'm training kids to um, really be observers, to be scientists, to be confident, to, to really using all five of their senses. It's really about a culmination of getting outside. Um, you know, meeting leopard slugs, looking at animal tracks in the snow, catching frogs, exploring leaves really close, dragonflies, tiny toads. I mean, it's just amazing. In forest camp, that's kind of like the culmination. And I teach kids how to net butterflies and damselflies. And then I show them. So I model it and then I invite them to try. And then I, what I call it, level up. And they eventually can do it themselves where they net the butterfly, they take it out properly, put it on a friend's hand and releases it. That is a direct experience in nature and it cannot be replaced. And I don't really think you can learn about nature without like touching it and being immersed in it. So it's really, that's the culmination of all of this. So there's, you know, going down to the beach, going down to the lake, climbing on big rocks and boulders, river stomping, right? You are all lucky. You've got the ocean. That's a whole nother thing, right? We just have the fresh coast, but that's awesome too. Um, grasshoppers and toads and finding a feather outside, trying to investigate what that might have, what, what bird did that come from, right? Uh, it's just, you know, climbing trees, finding a snake. There's no, you don't learn how to climb a tree from a book. You learn about climbing a tree by climbing a tree. A lot of these direct experiences are handed down through generations from a mom, a dad, a grandma, a grandpa, a cousin. Really that's the basis of the Urban Ecology Center is repeated exposure to a, a natural space within their neighborhood and introduced by a consistent mentor, me, right? So a lot of times you might not have somebody in your family that's, that knows how to fish or that's been camping. So sometimes you have to seek that out. And sometimes a community center or a nature center can help you in that. Or maybe that's one of your passions. It's important. Um, these are things that um, really have been handed down by generations. So it's important that we keep that going. So visiting the ponds and picking wildflowers and making violet jam. I mean, there's just so much. And every, you know, adventure brings new experiences. And by going out in every season, you teach kids a lot of self-efficacy, a lot of those things like how to judge the weather, how to get ready for the weather. These are important things. These are real life things. And then every week brings something new with the seasons. I think there's something about nature that encourages change. Like it brings us to accept change a little bit more because we look forward to it. And change is hard for some people. And nature is like the ultimate in change. And if you can really introduce accepting change and looking forward to change with really young children and adventures and the idea of mystery and you never know, that is some really powerful stuff. So, you know, everything's all like, oh, magic and, and butterflies. <laughs> but really, what you have to remember are there are barriers to enjoying the outdoors, right? Because it's not always fun. And sometimes it's for the kids and sometimes it's for the adults, right? To get excited about going out in the rain or going out in the cold, um, really the future favors the prepared. So what are some of those obstacles? If you remove these obstacles, you can really extend your outdoors. And that's really what it's about. Because it's not like dipping your toe and like going and looking outside, although 15 minutes, just like meditation, that's better than nothing, right? 
but really extended time outdoors is where really the boredom sets in and then the imagination kicks in. And that's when you start to see children really flourish in the outdoors and become comfortable, including adults, right? So in forest camp, we've got five weeks. The first five week session just ended. That's six to eight hours every day outside. We don't come inside unless it's thunder, lightning, tornado, something like that. So that's, we have before care outside, we have morning snack, we have lunch, we have afternoon snack, we have aftercare. So six to eight hours outside, kids are out there for five weeks. Half of those kids will extend to another five week session. So that is 10 weeks outdoors. Not only is that awesome for kids and they are just like a fish in water, but it's also awesome for me. I'm not stuck behind a desk, right? So it's really like something to aspire to is to spend as much time outside. And it's really quite a magical experience. So what are some of those barriers? Extreme temperatures without protection or relief. Unanticipated precipitation or conditions, right? I know on the West Coast there, you got lots of rain. So having the right gear, right? Inappropriate clothing and footwear. I tell you what, I don't like to be outside if I'm wet and cold, right? Neither do children. Um, but we have ways to um, prepare for that. Biting insects without protection or relief. Mosquitoes, black flies. Whew, some of those can be pretty gnarly. Another is fears based on experience or inexperience. So sometimes if you've been stung by a bee, boy, that really colors your opinion of the outdoors. Um, or like inexperiences, like there could be bears out there or there's, there's dangerous animals. It's like their imagination kind of runs wild. So a lot of the vicarious and, um, you know, indirect experiences go to combat both of those. Um, hunger and thirst. I tell you what, I always have squirrel snacks in my backpack. I tell you, it's never, if you're hungry or thirsty, it just makes things really difficult. So I always have extra snacks. I love feeding children. It's one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> well, I was like, yes, yes, yes. And it, it gets them to experience new foods too, which is awesome. Um, and then fatigue. So if you're tired, it's really a rough go, right? And um, there's ways that you can relax outside. Hammocks are really nice. And I tell you, a nap outside is something special. And then last but not least, a lack of bathroom access. So really, again, the future favors the prepared. So whatever you can do to mitigate these obstacles will help you extend your outdoor time. Really, comfort is the key for you and your children. It's really important. So when I'm outdoors, and I just got to make sure I'm staying good on the time here. We're doing good. Um, when I'm outdoors, I always have a backpack with me, no matter what. And then if we're outside for a long time, usually I have one or two carts. So. For our forest camp, we have 22 kids, K4, K5. And we've got about five adults. So it's me, Miss Alex, Miss Lizzie. Those are our three educators. And then we have two interns. And we usually go to an area. We have several natural spaces in our Riverside Park, like Turkey Run, or Hickory Hollow or the Willow, we name our play spaces and we map things out so that we have that shared language. And the kids are like, where are we going today? We're gonna to kick it a hit. Uh, we're gonna to go to Turkey Run today. And then we make backpack mountains. All kids have their backpacks and they put it in backpack mountain. And then all of the teachers have their backpacks. And then we also have a cart. Usually we have a logistics cart, which includes water and hand washing materials and things like that. And then we also have a fun cart that has like tools and different things, ropes and all sorts of different things. Um, so it always changes, right? Depending on what we're doing, how long we'll be out, blah, blah, blah. 
But a lot of times we have some of like the, the, the regular um, things that were in there. So here are some of the things that I include in my backpack or cart. Always have a first aid kit and instant ice packs. Two of the things that I use the most in outdoors for first aid are band-aids and ice packs. Most everything else requires a call, right? Um, but band-aids, even for things that aren't gnarly, just because it makes them feel better, and instant ice packs, usually for bumps and bruises and bee stings or whatever it might be. Um, we're all of our educators are first aid, CPR, AED certified. I'm a lifeguard. Um, you know, the training is really important, and that has to do with um, risks and hazards in the outdoors. Um, but as early childhood teachers, you're all certified. So you know what to do in emergency. Uh, we also have, have uh, for really cold weather, uh, sometimes we have hot hands, those things that you can break, and they're, those are more for emergencies. I don't like to bust out hot hands unless it's kind of a, a real deal. One thing that we do bring out though, for cold weather is, you know, those old school water bottles, those little water bladders that they used to, I don't know if they still use them anymore, but we call those water babies. And we put boiling water in there, and then those will stay warm all day. So if somebody's, you know, we always have a campfire in really cold weather because we do spring camp, summer camp, fall camp, and winter camp. So kids will, in the winter, will do um, 12 to four, four weeks outdoors. And I mean, we're in Wisconsin, so we're at single digit weather. Um, so we always have a campfire going, but also we use these water babies and that's really nice. So if somebody's extra cold, they can snuggle with that water bottle and it's just really kind of a thing. Also for really hot temperatures, we always have lots of spray bottles because that's instant rain. And it's amazing. Just a little bit of spray bottle on the back of the neck. Evaporation is a cooling process. It just does wonders. So shade and a water bottle, you're automatically 15, 20 degrees cool. Um, bug spray, sunscreen, very important. Uh, we always have plenty of water. That's to stay hydrated. Hand washing supplies. So what we do is we dilute hand washing soap in a little like honey bear and you put a little soap and then we have water bottles. We just wash hands outside. Um, a lot of times for licensing, as long as you are carrying, if you're washing hands outside <clears throat> before and after meals and you have everybody's emergency contact information, like essentially you're treating every time you go outside like a field trip, that's a great way to satisfy licensing. It's uh, really great. Um, I always have food in my backpack, raisins, craisins, dried food, goldfish, nips, whatever it might be. Always got to have a little bit of food. I always have a, a camera. I have a nice camera. It's really great to take photos of the nature that you experience and share that with parents and grandparents and adults. It just really brings their experience to life. And for some reason, when I take a photo of something, it makes it more special. So like when I see a Ruby Meadowhawk, I'm like, what'd you go, what'd you go? And I pull out my camera, get all paparazzi on it. Kids are like, whoa, like it's just super. Um, and then a phone. So uh, sometimes there's issues with keeping uh, pictures of kids on your own personal phone. So sometimes having a classroom uh, phone or camera is helpful. But it's really great to document those things because then when they experience it and then later you recapitulate it, it really bridges that neural gap and it really cements it in their experience. Um, read, you know, like recapitulating your experiences is very important. That's, a, that's another topic. Uh, you know, I usually have um, a bag for collecting trash. It's good to model, good stewardship. I always have a thermometer. It's a really great thing for kids to learn. Magnifying glasses. Monoculars are really difficult for kids to use. My pro tip is to get monoculars. Monoculars are much easier for kids to use. Um, but as they level up, monoculars aren't impossible. I've got ways to introduce that to children. Um, aerial nets, sweep nets, sane nets. So aerial nets are for catching things out of the air. Sweep nets are for sweeping the vegetation, putting them out 
and then exploring the insects that were in the vegetation. And same nets, um, they're kind of like a water or a fishing net. You put that in there and then you gather like macroinvertebrates and things like that. So different types of nets, collection containers with holes so that they can breathe, soil and snow shovels, uh, hand saws, whittling tools and sandpaper. Yes, I said hand saws with very young children. Um, that is something that you scaffold. So fire, tools, things like that. If you scaffold those experiences, I do all of those things with very young children, three to six years old. Um, tree swings and ropes, uh, really easy. A tarp for shade, rain, or a puppet, uh, puppet stage. I usually have some sort of puppets or cuteness in my backpack. You know, you never know. A lot of times kids like to take finger puppets and put them outside and make little shelters for them. Um, you know, fairy houses, things like that. And then, you know, depending on your whims, sidewalk chalk. I have what's called a pocket kite. It's a kite that fits in my backpack. You bust that out, you've got some good wind. You can't see wind. Children can't see wind, but they can feel it, right? Seeing that as bubbles, kaleidoscopes, tree cookies, levers and fulcrums to make like launchers, parachute cord, twine, clothespins, rubber animal tracks, buckets. Uh, I like taking buckets, putting mud and water with those big fat like paint brushes and they can make forts and paint their fort or you can um, paint smiley faces on the trees, right? It's kind of like ephemeral art. It's like, you know, it's really cool. Uh, and then also I have like a treasure tr detector. A lot of times that's just like a small Frisbee and then I throw it and then wherever it lands, we explore what's underneath it. I also let kids do that, right? I mean, your imagination is bound by, you know, just your, what's available. You can, it's, you know, it's, it's so much fun. Less is best, but it's always fun. I usually don't bust out everything at once. Usually, um, you know, for tools like shovels, I'll only have four. I never have something for every kid because we're also teaching them how to share, right? So it's kind of built in. So um, we've got a few minutes here. I'm going to go through these last portions. I think one of the um, one of the last one of the one of the things that I I get asked about a lot is um, risk um, in the outdoors. A lot of people are afraid to take young children outside, um, but I'm here to tell you that you can do it. And there's a way to kind of like frame yourself to understand um, the difference between risk versus a hazard. So risks are essential for early childhood. Children taking risks is essential. Keep that in mind. We could do a whole session on risk because it is really, really important. So um, a risk is an action chosen by an individual that poses a chance for injury. So this picture where you're seeing kids rambling down the creek, to some that might make you really super nervous. But that is something that is important for kids. They need to like traverse uneven surfaces, right? If their entire world is a rubberized playground, how, how are they going to learn to like crank around and do stuff, right? So but a risk is something that's easily identifiable. It yields growth. It's approached with a base of knowledge and it has an element of control. Risks are essential in early childhood. So a good example would be a big log over a creek, right? Balancing over there, the risk would be, you know, a consequence. They might get wet or fall over, a bruise or a bump, some embarrassment, right? But the benefits include persistence, courage, resilience, self-confidence. These, are, that's what we're tasked with. We're tasked with building up children so that they can face the world and do great things. 
risk is part of that. So that could change though. So here we have Kelvin and Hobbes crossing a log, big gnarly log with big jagged edges over a deep river. You don't know how deep that is. You don't know what's, where it's going, you, you know, the flow rate. So a hazard is a condition that poses a likelihood of injury. So hazards are difficult or impossible to assess. They cause serious harm. This isn't a bounce, it's a break. A lack of knowledge or awareness. So a child climbing a tree that's rotten, right? We can assess that, right? As adults, we can look at that and say, that branch is rotten and it has a chance for them to fall, right? So, but children don't have that. So a lack of knowledge or awareness and then a lack of control, right? So if I can leave one thing with you today when it comes to risk versus hazards is that nature play or going outside should take place in a space that has hazards managed by adults, but with risks or challenges managed by children during play. So this scene right here is Hubbard Park here on Milwaukee River. To some, that might seem like really a not safe place to play. We go there all the time. What you do is you mitigate those risks and you manage the hazards by being prepared, by being trained, by being observant, by being present. We always say one risk, one teacher, because as long as you can see what's going on, you're already ahead of the game. With licensing, they wanna know that you have a plan. They wanna know that you're thinking four steps ahead of the children and that you have things under control. But doing risky things is important. High speeds, jumping off high things, climbing trees, doing things like that. These are what kids have been doing since the beginning of time. So what are the advantages to increase time outside? Again, play is the highest form of research. It is absolutely essential. And if I could add something to that, it would be unstructured play. Adult play and managed play is not the same as unstructured play. And some folks call that like free range, but it's not that. It's, it's structured in that we're managing hazards and we're posing, you know, we're giving children those opportunities to overcome risk and challenges, but really it's letting them kind of be kids and interact with each other, less uh, adult driven play. So what are the benefits, right? Opportunities for fresh air, exercise, fine gross motor development. On a daily basis in forest camp, I'm between 15,000 and 20,000 steps. Kids are like cranking around all the time. Their steps are smaller, but more frequent. You know, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm 50, so I'm a little bit more sedentary than them, but it's like exercise, it's going outside. Practicing for the weather, self efficacy This is, I cannot stress how important that is. Parents will high five you to the end of the world if you can teach kids to get ready to go outside with the quickness. Practice working together in a group setting, cooperation. Positive shared experiences increases group cohesiveness. It's really great for uh, to do adventures. Um, it just really brings a group together. Practicing listens, listening and following direction, impulse control, right? Assessing risk, overcoming obstacles, meeting challenges, opportunities to express empathy. That could be one of the top three words that we're charged with in our world with very young children is teaching them empathy, especially for young ones. Um, care and gratitude for the environment. Opportunity to overcome uninformed fears based on learned behaviors. Um, scientists don't go, ew, they go, oh. That's how we do it. Model, invite, praise. Direct experiences in nature, they bridge those vicarious and indirect experiences that they have in the classroom. 
So it makes those storybooks come alive, right? And then it's real, it's real life. Um, teachable moments emerge all the time in outdoor exploration. I, I just can't, I mean, we could have an entire um, session on just meeting your development in growth goals. You know, the uh, Washington State, your, um, you know, uh, Thrive by Five and all of those, I mean, you can meet all of your classroom goals by just going outside. Um, and then kids have been going outside, exploring, falling down, getting dirty, climbing things since the beginning of time. You are helping them fulfill their dreams. Um, the last thing that I'll leave you with is some of my tips uh, for exploring outdoors. Again, the future favors the prepared. Proper outdoor clothing, age-appropriate content, thoughtful pacing, flexible structure, stocked backpack and cart. Clear, simple boundaries for group management and exploration. When I take kids on a field trip, the two things I tell them, I say, hold up one finger, point that finger at me. I'm the leader, stay behind me unless I let you run ahead. I have to give it to you. Show me two fingers, take those two fingers, put them together. We're a group. We need to act that way. That's all. Everything else is our lot in life. We just repeat, right? I have one liners for every scenario, but usually kids can handle however many directions they are old. So there's no need to go through the laundry list of stuff that might happen. You just need to tell them to stick with you and stay behind because you're, you're in charge. Positive affect, enthusiasm, confidence, very important. Everything is awesome in early childhood, right? Less is best with teaching content. Too many lessons, activities, transitions that stifles inquiry-based learning and makes for structured play. Just skip it. Let, let nature be your kind of emergent content. Model explora exploration, curiosity, and wonder. I always say, what we do is we model, invite, and praise. Heap praise on children when they exhibit the behaviors in the outdoors that you wanna see them do. And then fun, fun, fun. Nature and on is that, here. Matt, we're going to have to end so we don't waste anyone's time. Everybody was so kind to share with us today. Um, thank you. I just, there's so much that you put in this that just really touches my heart. I am going to quickly, I've got names here, and I'm pulling a name. Who's winning? Martha. Martha Papia. Woohoo! I'll be getting this to you next week. Um, again, if you have any questions, hopefully we can address them through emails. I really appreciate your time. Miss Violetta, you've just been fabulous. Mary, thank you for all your support. I really appreciate you being here. And maybe if we're lucky, we can have Matt come back again and share more with us about this. So if you're interested, let me know because I could just I could just live with you, Matt, and listen to you all the time. So thank, thank you, you so all much. very much. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy your day. Thanks thank for spending you. your Saturday with us. Yes, thank you very much. And Martha, you're the lucky one. <laughs> <laughs> Gracias. <laughs> oh. Wow, Matt, just let me just say some highlights. For me, I love Backpack Mountain. The spray <laughs> bottle for rain, it was like a light bulb moment. Um, oh, and the treasure detector, I'm stealing that one. I am so using that one, that was just great. So thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. I really enjoyed. Uh, it, it was kind of funny though, because you know, it's I knew that the time difference, so I had to like wait until eleven o'clock, and I, I'm I'm a punctual person, and I was like, oh my gosh, I just felt like I was late, late, late. So, which is kind of funny, right? <laughs> uh, I really appreciate you inviting me for this presentation. Matt, I, I'm really going to put a survey out to everybody that attended and see if there's 
different aspects that they would like you to kind of do a deeper dive on so we can get you back again. Um, it just really touched my heart. Does anybody want to share what was a big moment for them? Okay. <laughs> All righty. Well, thank you all very much. I'll be emailing you on Monday, and I really appreciate all of your time. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.